thank you all for coming today. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus, but before I get into who our speaker is and what we'll be discussing, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the co-chairs of the caucus, and that's Representative Steve Stivers of Ohio, Representative Joe Barton of Texas, Representative Jackie Spear from California, and Representative Steve Cohen from Tennessee. The Coalition for Life Sciences, for which I am the director of, has been hosting these monthly caucuses for 28 years now. But it is the commitment and dedication of the chairs of the caucus that ensures that we are able to host these briefings and the opportunities for you to hear from some of this nation's top scientists. Um, today, the lights are very bright. Um, today, it truly is my honor to introduce today's speaker. He is not just one of the leading scientists in the country, but also my mentor and chair of the Coalition for Life Sciences, Dr. Keith Yamamoto. Today, he will give us an overview of the NIH. The NIH is the largest public funder of medical research in the world, paving the way for important discoveries that improve health and save lives. We will hear from Dr. Yamamoto as he highlights how the process at NIH works from peer review process to how the institute sets priorities. As the University of California, San Francisco's first vice chancellor for science policy and strategy, Keith Yamamoto leads efforts to anticipate the needs of an increasingly dynamic biomedical research endeavor. Throughout his career, he has been focused on the practice of science, science education and mentoring, peer review, communication of sciences, science and advocacy for federal support for research. He also directs a research laboratory that for 40 years has made important discoveries on mechanisms that regulate gene expression in health and disease. After earning his PhD from Princeton University, uh, Dr. Yamamoto joined the UCSF faculty. He has served in several leadership roles, including the chair of the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology, vice dean for research in the School of Medicine, and vice chancellor for research. He chaired the committee that led the planning of the UCSF Mission Bay campus. Dr. Yamamoto chairs or serves on numerous national committees, focusing on wide range of areas. For example, public and scientific policy, public understanding and support of biological research, science education, and training the biomedical workforce. He is an elected member of the National Academies of Science, National Academy of Medicine, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and American Academy of Microbiology, and is a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I know we are all looking forward to hearing you speak today, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Yamamoto. Thanks, Lynn. It sounded ominously like Um, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks to all, all of you for coming. I know you're here for the food, but um, uh, we're going to talk about NIH. Um, I think that the fact that there's so many of you here says that, that you're at least familiar, probably some, I know some of you are deeply familiar with what uh, goes on in, the, in this agency, but it's an important one at, at, and coming at an important time. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to, to kind of just run through these three P's um, uh, and, and uh, give you a flavor of uh, what the NIH is, how it's organized, and how it takes on what is really a tough challenge of uh, doing research that will impact uh, health, uh, will attack and uh, uh, treat and cure disease, um, and, and um, uh, will uh, change the quality of life uh, of our citizens. Um, uh, and, and, it's, and it's a tall order, uh, it, it, even taller than, than you may think when you think about it in the abstract. And I'll try to drive it down to enough specifics that you get a little bit of a, of, of a feel for that. So the NIH. The NIH uh, actually has been called the crown jewel of federal spending. Um, uh, so why is that? Um, I think that a, a primary reason is that it actually does really accomplish its mission to turn discoveries into health. That's quite a mission, if you think about it. Um, and, and so the mission statement actually says to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and apply that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. It has a lot of money. Um, uh, as scientists, we fret about not having enough money, but $34 billion in FY17 
um, uh, uh, is a lot of money. So invest that, do those dollars to support biomedical research. So it's a funding agency. It gives away uh, money for research to be accomplished. Now, while $34 billion is a lot of money, and we're, we can't shy away from that, um, uh, I think the, a comment that Mary Lasker, one of the great champions for biomedical research made years ago, I, I think is, is, uh, is notable. And that is, if, if you think research is expensive, try disease. Um, and so if you look at the healthcare spend in this country right now, uh, $34 billion is about exactly 1%. Um, and so Lasker was right. If you think research is expensive, try disease. And so that 1% that investment in research that can have the kinds of effects that we'll talk about um, uh, is, is uh, why I'm arguing that this is a really important thing for us to be considering. And, and we, can, we can extend it, and I will, to the notion that um, uh, we obviously need to do something about the healthcare spend in this country. In a couple of years, it'll be 20% of the GDP, um, and it keep, will keep going. Uh, and if it does keep going, we won't. Um, and so we need to do something about that. So 80%, more than 80%, I think it's 83%, of that $34 billion for FY17 goes out of Washington, goes to more than 1,700 universities, medical schools, research institutes, and hundreds of service, supply, and technology companies. In 2016, it accounted for 300, over, over 380,000 jobs that are out in your districts and states and contributing over 65 billion to your local economies. So it's a big impact, and you can think of the NIH's spend in terms of what it does for the economy of your district and your state. So even if you don't even think about the health <laughs> component, which is the most important part, um, there's a big impact there. So, so then you can ask, um, uh, how does that actually work? Uh, when we say it accomplishes its mission um, uh, to, to um, uh, understand fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems, why is that important, first of all? Um, and then apply that knowledge to enhance health. Um, how does that work? It's a big challenge because, you know, there are a lot of diseases, and people are very concerned about the ones that are affecting them or their family or their friends, justifiably so. Right. And so they're going to come to Washington and say, let's spend more money on disease X. Fair enough. Right. So how do those decisions actually get made? How does the NIH accomplish its mission? You could look at it in one way, just simply looking at the organization of the agency. Um, and what you find is that there are 27 separate institutes. The NIH is a loose federation. It has a director, Francis Collins, who some of you know or have heard, have, uh, uh, heard speak or uh, had a chance to talk with. And then there are 27 topical institutes, each of which has a director, but more importantly, each of which gets a budget, individual budget, to the dollar from Congress. And they come to the Hill every year to argue their case for why the National Cancer Institute or the National Institute on Aging needs its money the kinds of things it's doing with its money, and the impact that that work is having. And down there in, in green, you see um, uh, uh, a, uh, an ad, and that is a Center for Scientific Review, CSR. We're going to come back to that later, but just to make the point now that that's the little sub-agency within the NIH that actually uh, reviews the grant applications for the quality of the science. This is the merit review phase, um, and, and that's a, an agency that is not tied to any of the institutes, not tied to any of the, the guys that have money. And their job is simply to take all the grant applications that come in and make an assessment of the quality of the work, the scientific merit of the work that's been, been proposed by investigators in my institution or in ones in your districts and states. So we'll come back to that, because the review, the review process, the peer review process, is a key part of what makes the NIH so distinctive in the scientific enterprise in the world. <clears throat> All 
All right, so you could say, all right, so now I get a little feel for how this agency works, and it is that there are different sub-agencies within the NIH that are charged with, with working on um, uh, fundamental knowledge and, and diseases in a given sector. The problem, there's a problem with this, though, and that is that we don't know very much about how biological processes work. In fact, we know very little. So despite all of the work that's gone on and all of the fantastic studies that have uh, been completed that have given us a clearer view, our, the, the amount that we don't know still vastly uh, uh, outranks what we actually do know. So, each, so it's true that each of these agents, sub-agencies, each of the institutes, gets money to give away to grant applicants. But the problem is that, that, that tying that money directly to the topic of the agency is difficult. It's difficult be because we understand so little about how biology works. So let me give you a feel for what the NIH does then. What the NIH does is to have a research portfolio that is divided amongst three kinds of work in the, in the ratio that's shown in this pyramid. So 60 percent uh, or so, a little bit lower than that now, <coughs> of the allocations go to something called basic research. That's fundamental discovery about how biological processes work. And then a smaller fraction goes to translational work that's bridging the understanding of the fundamental knowledge to actual clinical work, and then a smaller part yet to clinical research. So that ratio is actually was actually set out um, uh, to uh, make an adjustment to a number that was put forth back in the 1950s. Um, that ratio in which it was 55, I think it was 55 percent basic research and 45 percent clinical. There wasn't translational, that translational term hadn't been invented yet. And when Elias Zerhouni was the director of the NIH about a decade ago, he laid out this challenge that this is the ratio that the NIH should be supporting. I think the numbers are, right now are about 52 percent of, of basic research and then it drops in the, and so there's a little bit more money going into translational and clinical. But the NIH makes a, an effort to keep it that way. Why would it do that? Why would it put most of its attention into these fundamental studies? So, so the priority then, the prioritization says, discover these fundamental mechanisms of biological processes and then use that knowledge to uh, understand and treat and cure disease. So that's the pathway. And it says that if we're going to really be able to do this work on disease effectively, we have to understand the mechanisms of the disease. There's a second really important reason why the NIH has its portfolio in the way that it does. And that is, that's in, it's interesting, and that is that, the, that public money, the federal money, the money that you are all working on and with, right, um, uh, has to fund the fundamental stuff because because industry can't. Basic research is untargeted. It's not setting out to study some disease. It's starting out to understand something about how cells move together or connect with each other, right? Um, how a, uh, a neuron can extend all the way the length of your body to a specific place in your brain. How does it do that? So it's understanding fundamental processes. And those, those questions can take a long time to answer years to answer. NIH grants are four to five years in length, right? And you all know that industry, especially now with the world economy, can't sustain anything more than year over year at most, often quarter over quarter, demonstrations of return on investment. And if those demonstrations aren't there, the stockholders aren't happy, the boards of trustees aren't happy, and the company says, we got to stop doing basic research. We can't, we can't support it. So it's the federal government that has to do that. That really came from uh, this guy, Vannevar Bush, who I quote below the, tr the pyramid. In 1945, he was, he was asked by President Roosevelt to say, what is it that the federal government should do with this alliance that we've made with scientists through the World War II effort that was so important and so critical? Should we maintain that friendship that we have with the scientists? 
or should we should we drop it? So at that before before World War II, very little, if any, federal money was going into academic institutions to support research in academia. And what Bush did in writing a report about this, a report that he called Science the Endless Frontier, was to, was to make the argument that, that, this is, that the alliance with scientists had been so spectacular, the federal government had to maintain it. And he had a, he had a, way, he had a cool way to do it. Right? And he said, we'll build a few national laboratories, and some of you may have national labs in your states or districts. Right? But, but we can save a bunch of money by capitalizing on the fact that universities have hired a bunch of brilliant scientists that are, and put them in buildings that they built and are working away. So if we simply make an alliance with acad academic research institutions, we can save money compared to building our own laboratories, hiring our own scientists and paying them. And we'll just put in some money to help that uh, go along. So it's really since 1945 that that alliance was built and has been so spectacularly effective. And it was because, the Feder because Bush recognized that, that, that public money was the only money that could really support this fundamental discovery. Right? And, and if, it, if that work were, to go, that were then to go forward, then, we could, then there could be an alliance with the private sector, with industry, that says, here's some fundamental knowledge that you can use to make something right, that will actually um, uh, affect the lives of people, something you can sell, and something you can convince your stockholders you can make in the kinds of timelines that industry is used to. So there's the argument. The priorities are for, are for basic science. The, the reasons are that, that we have to understand the, those fundamental pieces of information to understand disease, right? So, so, so there you have it. So why really? Why can't we just say we want to work on uh, the common cold? We know the rhinovirus causes it. We've crystallized it. We know where every atom is. But there's still not a cure for common cold. We're still taking DayQuil, right? And and somebody, yeah, there you go. <coughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, so it's because we know so little. Um, and and, um, uh, and, and, and so uh, the, this question of why it is we need to, to uh, focus on basic science. And the reason is that biology is complicated. And it's complicated for a good reason, for a great reason. So I've diagrammed three pathways, one of them unidirectional, fertilized egg to embryo, and two of them bidirectional, the things that are going on in your body all the time, a balance of fat breakdown and fat buildup, cells that decide to divide or decide not to divide, and you know the consequences when they don't pay attention to the stop signs and keep dividing. Those processes are actually encoded in your DNA, in every cell in your body. Right? But the processes, the processes themselves are not hardwired, even though the DNA sequence is. The way that those processes play out right, uh, is not by a simple switch or by a, a linear, nice, tidy, linear, linear pathway. If it was, if it was hardwired, our bodies, we would not be able to sense and respond to changes in our physiology, to you know, our environment, things that you may be facing or breathing uh, all the time, to your experience over the, court, the timeline of your life. It's, these are the things that make each of us different, even if we have an identical twin. right? And that is that those responses are different and the way that our genes work are different even though the genes themselves are hardwired, the way the processes play out are not. The fact that you're eating lunch right now is having an effect on the fat breakdown, fat buildup uh, uh, pathway. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, um, and, and, uh, and so even during the, pro the course of this talk. So instead of this nice, tidy uh, pathway, evolution has given us the capacity, the ability, to respond to other stuff that's coming at us. 
that make our genes work differently, even within our own bodies, depending on what's out there, what's facing us, whether we're stressed, whether we're hungry, and so forth. And so instead, it looks like a mess, like a plate of spaghetti, right? Because every one of your cells is studded with a series of antennae that are kind of on the lookout for signals. They're actually, they're actually antennae within each of your cells as well as outside on the surface of your cells. Um, uh, and, and, and then what happens is when those antennae get tickled by a signal, a molecular signal like a hormone, some of you are familiar with small chemicals in your bloodstream of that sort, they hit a, one of those antennae and they tickle it and say, okay, I'm here. And then the consequence you can follow that goes into the cell, right, and starts triggering a set of signal responses, responses to those antennae getting signaled. And you can see that they're not linear either. They're talking to each other. And so as different combinations of antennae get tickled, right, you can see what happens in those different twisted pathway. And then finally you go into the nucleus and there are proteins inside the nucleus that are, gonna, that are in charge of controlling your, the expression of your genes that, are then, that, that have then been decorated in certain ways depending on the antennae that have been tickled. And then they go down to the genes and they say, all right, we're the combination of all of the experiences of our pathway out in the cytoplasm of the cell and the gene will respond accordingly. Now, if you look at that, you can see that, first of all, it's really complicated. Um, and what you end up at the bottom is this biological process, right? Or a disease process, because disease is a simply a normal process going awry in some way. And you can see then that um, um, the, 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 the comp complexity of biology, we can celebrate because it allows us to respond to what's around us, right? But it also means that disease is also has to be complicated. So if there are mutations in any of those genes, whether they're in the antennae or the signal transduction pathway in the, this plate of spaghetti in the middle, any of those genes, or the genes in the nucleus that finally end up talking to the DNA to say, express the gene a lot, express the gene a little, don't stop expressing it, express it at the wrong time, right? Um, uh, now you can see that any one of the genes that encodes the factors that are anywhere on there, the antennae, the signaling pathway, the, the gene controlling proteins, right, could be a disease gene. It could affect the way a normal process works, right? And so when you pick up the post in the morning and it says a disease gene for thus and so disease has been discovered, and you think, oh, God, I hope I don't have this. And then you read down to the second paragraph, and it says, yeah, and if you have this mutation, your, in, your chances of getting this disease have gone up fivefold. And you think, oh, I'm, I'm not even going to make it to lunch. And then you see that the fivefold is going from 0.1% to 0.5%. You think, what's going on? And what's going on is that it's in one of these complicated pathways. And in fact, there are ways that the cell can take that go around a change, right? So it'll have a little effect, but not a lot. But in aggregate, you could really have a problem on your hands, okay? <clears throat> so all of, the, all of those genes on that map could actually be disease genes. Now there's an interesting corollary to this complexity. And that is that there are ways for scientists to get at all of this. <clears throat> that are simpler than having to face the big plate of spaghetti out the, uh, right, just right out of the gate. And that is to use um, model organisms, simpler organisms, right? And you can see how many of those that you can identify on the pictures here. But the fact is that simpler organisms are, really are simpler. Their plates of spaghetti are less complicated. There's fewer antennae, right? They can't respond to all the stuff that you can respond to, right? So they allow simpler, more definitive experiments because you can um, uh, uh, be able to draw a conclusion to affecting one of those genes, right, which doesn't have so, many, so much crosstalk that you can't interpret the result. Right? And different organisms, 
have different combinations of the pathways. And so you can get at them all if you choose the right organism. So complex organisms, like you, obviously evolved from simpler organisms. And so it follows that if we pick the simpler organism wisely for the pathway that we're interested in, we can learn more and take that uh, quick, more quickly and take that knowledge and go back up to you, to a complex organism, and be able to draw, test the hypothesis and then draw conclusions. And it works. It works great. So look at the sources of the, the big breakthroughs in science. Right? Gene regulation really mapped out in bacteria and the vi viruses that, affect, that infect bacteria. Cell division, pretty important, right? Cancer, right? Worked out in baker's yeast and clawed toads. Cancer genes, first found in chicken viruses. Development of fruit flies, sea urchins, and fish. Aging and lifespan in soil worm, and this is always everybody's favorite, pond scum. Learning and memory in a sea snail. Uh, neuron target connections. Um, um, a spectacular experiment done by Mark Tessier Levine when he was a faculty member at UCSF, now the president of Stanford, um, uh, in which he and his lab colleagues uh, dissected 25,000 chicken embryos uh, to find a molecule that was in charge of dis um, allowing a neuron to track from its, pl its place in the embryo to the right place in the brain. Amazing stuff. So it works. So now the question is, now that we know that we can get into this stuff in straightforward ways, how do we make sure that those fundamental discoveries then get translated up to having an effect on disease prevention or, in, or treatment or hopefully a cure. <clears throat> and here's the way to do it. It's called, and you may have heard the term, precision medicine. Right, there's a presidential, initi presidential initiative, the Cures Act that uh, uh, your members were involved in passing uh, extends uh, funding for precision medicine for a decade. And it's, sim it's simple. It's just an approach to doing research and aggregating information. And it says, let's do Google Maps for biology. Google Maps, well, you know what Google Maps is. It's just a way to sort data into different data types, right? And then see the connections between the different data types. It's all Google Maps does. So it separates transportation systems and land use and census tracts and structures and Starbucks and <coughs> postal codes. And because there's a single registration point, which is geography, you can drop a plumb line straight through each of the layers and see where the Starbucks is relative to the railroad, right? So the idea of precision medicine is, let's do the same thing. Let's take every different kind of data, right? Your electronic medical record, right? The proteins that you're expressing after you eat a big meal, right? Um, what's in your genome, right? How you respond to various signals and signs. If you were a smoker when you were young or lived in a city with a lot of pollution, right? Uh, all that stuff. Sort them all out, stack them up in a way, and it's, oh, stacking up only means putting, putting them on a common basis so computationally relationships can be seen. Only, the only catch is there's not a common registration point like geography that Google Maps has, right? And so you're stuck with that pesky research thing to figure out the relationships between the different points on the map. But that's what precision medicine is. It says, pull together all of the information, not just about you, not just about people, and certainly not just about patients, because we want to know about well people, but also about fruit flies and clawed toads and pond scum. Right? And register that information in ways that we can see relationships between them, and if we do that really well, we'll begin to, under, we'll begin to achieve precision medicine, to build a data network that aggregates and analyzes information from all these different sets, right? 
and what would come out the bottom would be new hypotheses for basic scientists, as well as precision health advice and diagnosis and treatment that drills down all the way to the level of individuals. So I'm not going to read all of this, but just this to say that the outcomes of precision medicine will be profound. And maybe the biggest one is the fourth carrot, right? And that is that it would actually reduce healthcare costs, at least reduce the slope of the curve, if not turn it, right? Because there would be improved prevention, so people would just be healthier, much earlier and precise diagnosis. And you all know that the earlier you can diagnose a disease, the better chance you have of curing it. Better control of chronic disease, and this is a big one, avoidance of unnecessary tests and ineffective therapies. Blockbuster drugs are not drugs that work on everyone. They're drugs that don't kill anyone. And so everybody can buy them and take them, and it costs a lot of money. Big medical centers like UCSF, when a patient comes in and it's not clear what's going on with her, we throw the book of clinical tests. Some of them are, are going to be useful for the patient, and, uh, and some of them are not. They can be pretty expensive. So if we can do precision medicine, that's what will happen. So then we're back to prioritization. It says, study all biological processes where they can best be understood, pull together information, and then use that information to inform diagnosis to develop new um, uh, research uh, avenues um, and, and do something to advance clinical care to the level of individuals. So then, if that's what we're doing, who makes these decisions? We haven't really gotten to that yet, have we? We haven't really said how the NIH really works. So it turns out that who makes the NIH priority decisions are scientists themselves. Almost all of them, volunteers who raise their hands and say, yeah, I'll come to Washington, uh, Bethesda, and help out reviewing grant um, uh, applications. So how are those decisions made? It's peer review. You've heard the term or you know in detail what it is, but it is, that's what it is. It's peers, other scientists, reviewing the, the proposals of people who send these things in to the NIH. You can think of all, you're, you probably are thinking of all of the things that can be, go wrong in such a system, right? But I'm going to make an argument to you that it's the best way to do this. So what is NIH peer review? How does it work, right? So we start by just tell, telling you, reminding you, that the NIH has got a whole raft of different research grant mechanisms. The largest and the best set are uh, the so-called investigator-initiated proposals that are fully at the discretion of the scientists, and it really does mean that. The biggest set of NIH grants simply says, send us an idea, period, done. Right. And what that does is that it says to the scientists, you think you're so smart, you have an active imagination, you think you know how something works, just tell us. Right? It may be something that we haven't thought of, and so we're not going to tie you down. So the best grants are these investigator-initiated, and so those of you who are, into the who are into the lingo may have heard the phrase R01. So the R01 grant is that. It just says, send us an application. Right. You also know that there are big grant challenges out there, the Brain Initiative, the Precision Medicine Initiative, right? And the best of those, right, are, uh, do very little to tie the hands of investigators. <coughs> and if they're really good, they actually draw investigators in who think they can make a contribution, who don't think of themselves as people, even people, even people who are working on biomedical research. Right? Um, and that, that can make a difference. So I'm, there's a scientist at UCSF who is a neurosurgeon, works on epilepsy operates on people, opens up their heads, right? And he realized that since he was in there and he had, had the brain exposed, he could actually map circuits by putting in a little electro, a set of a, map, a, a chip 
of electrodes on the surface of the brain and map um, neural circuits. And so when the Brain Initiative came out, he went to the Lawrence Livermore lab and talked to material scientists, engineers who don't know from biology, right? And said, I need something special. Do you guys have anything that I can put, I can put little electrodes into a chip that when I lay it on the, a brain of a human being, which is at 98.6 degrees, the stuff will melt into all the little crevices of the brain and I can map the circuits accurately. Because if I just put a plate on the top, I miss all that stuff. Right? So suddenly, material scientists, engineers, were doing brain research. So the best of the grand challenges do that. They bring in people that didn't know they could make a contribution, right? almost always as, as part of a team, um, that then can actually make a, a contribution. So those are good. There are, I have to say, some tightly constrained programs, sort of the equivalent of ear earmarks in your world, right, that actually uh, are a problem because they constrain the imagination. They say, they, they say, we want you to do this experiment, right? I don't like those, and scientists aren't as, as, as into those, but we go where the money is. So that's the framework. And now it is an evaluation by scientists um, of the scientific merit of the proposed research. 80% of the, that great big NIH budget is allocated in this way and goes out into scientists in your districts and states. Right. The process is managed by that Center for Scientific Review, CSR, that I flagged earlier. <clears throat> That's independent of the institutes themselves. And the reviews are executed in those meetings that I pictured here of people who have spent roughly two weeks before coming to, to Bethesda to read these grant applications carefully and then come together and share their expertise and their judgment of the merit of each of the applications. So in fact, the truth is that, that NIH grants are actually reviewed twice. There's two levels of evaluation for every grant application. The first one I just talked about and that's the study section, the, the, the group of experts in a given area of study who are charged um, uh, to uh, assess the scientific merit of the application. So their, their, their um, uh, currency is knowledge. And then there's an institute council where not only scientists are involved, but non-scientists, non-scientists who are interested in the work of a given institute. This is a place where the public, non-scientists, can actually have a say about the way that the NIH works and allocates its funds. Their currency is currency. They got the money, right? And they ask, they, they get the review score that I'll show you in a moment from the study section, and they say, all right, this, this got reviewed by the scientists as being really good. Does it really fit the portfolio of the National Cancer Institute? Uh, if so, we'll use cancer money to pay for it. If not, maybe another institute will pick it up, um, uh, usually not, um, and, and things go from there. So the Center for Scientific Review, I'm not going to drag you through this at all. I'm just trying to put it on here to kind of snow you with how complicated the process is. The CSR oversees 80,000 grant applications per year. Um, there are 250 of these expert study panels um, uh, and that, that then make these assessments of scientific merit. There are, there's a set of five review criteria that every reviewer has to address, right? Um, and you can scan these yourselves, but impact. How important is the work? If the work gets done, will it move the field, right? Are the, are the experiments, the way that the problem is going to be approached um, uh, uh, appropriate? Is it innovative or has it been done over and over again by other people? How good is the investigator, and how good is the environment, the place that the investigator is working? Will that actually help the work get done? So each of the reviewers has to address each of those criteria for every application, and, when, and then when they're done, they assign an overall score, an integer one to nine, one on top. You can look at the, the, the word descriptors. 
of how good the scientific merit is. There's 20 people in the room, their scores get multiplied by 10 and averaged. So the final score that the investigator gets back ranges from 10 to 90. So there's 81 gradations, way more than the human brain can actually make, but you know, there you are. Um, it used to be 499 gradations. We reduced it. Um, uh, and, and, um, uh, and then the score comes back and says, this is what the study section thinks of the overall merit of your application, you know, Mr. Investigator. <coughs> Um, uh, there are obviously complexities of peer review. You've undoubtedly thought of them and realized that there's direct conflicts of interest. If you bring in an expert in a given area, it may be a direct competitor of the person whose review, whose, whose, whose grant they're reviewing, right? They happen, may be in the same institution. That's not going to work, right? Uh, they may have trained them or worked with them. That's not going to work. So. The NIH has to manage these uh, obvious intrinsic conflicts of interest and pick up other ones as well. It has to operate on this big scale, 80,000 grant applications, and incorporate those um, uh, metrics for, for, for review. There's different types and styles of research that merit support. Uh, we've talked about basic research, basic translational and clinical research. And social and behavioral research is also very important to take into consideration. There's people that move the ball and could be judged as having advancing work in an incremental way that's crucial. And other ones who say, you know, I think that this whole idea is wrong um, and I've got a better idea. Um, and, and so they can actually apply for a specific kind of grant called transformative that actually undoes paradigms instead of, instead of extending them, right? Um, and new technologies sometimes are applied for directly, and sometimes they just drop out of other kinds of basic research that's being done. And you probably know already that what really makes science move in a nonlinear way that allows us to leap ahead are new technologies, things that allow us to do things that we couldn't do before, or to be see things more clearly, or to see them faster, right? Uh, than we could before. And those new technologies can advance whole fields in nonlinear ways. Sometimes they come out by intent, sometimes not. The end product of all of that is, is that remarkable things can happen from this sort of prescribed, stereotyped, not very interesting process, right? Um, and remarkable stuff happens. I'm going to give you one example because you may have heard uh, you've all undoubtedly heard about human genome editing and all of the opportunities and possibilities and ethical dilemmas that th that, that technology raises. But I want to tell you where it came from because it's an amazing story of NIH peer review. So the human genome editing, and, and you may have heard the term CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR technology that this is just the, the methods that allow human genome edit, human, allow, allow science to go into your cells, your living cells, and change your genome in specific ways. So you can immediately think, well, if you have a single gene disease and you can just change it to being normal, you're good, you're done, right? If you change it on the germline, all of your kids are good and so forth, all right? So, so there's some obvious stuff. Where did that all come from? This miracle that really has jumped on the field and is transforming research uh, from, the, from very fundamental uh, questions to application. It started with a scientist who, who's, who was interested in understanding the consequences of environment on, on bacterial um, uh, uh, genomes and behavior. And she was a scientist at Berkeley. She, she was interested in, uh, among other things, sequencing bacteria that grow in acidic, to basically toxic waste dumps. And so she wrote an application that says, I want to sequence these bacteria and see what their genomes look like. Because it's amazing that they can do this. Now, uh, some study section member might have said, 
I don't care about bacteria that grow in toxic waste dumps. You know, enough with them already. But the study some, that study section said, we're good. Go sequence those bacteria. Tell us what you find. And they did. And they found some funny things in the genome I won't take you through, right? And other people saw those reports that have been funded by the NIH. And they began to study what those funny little repeats in the genome did. And they realized that it was the immune system of bacteria. And so they wrote a grant, or they made a hypothesis that it was the immune system of bacteria. So they wrote a grant and said, hey, I think I know what these funny little things in the genome are. I think it's the immune system of the bacteria. And the study section member could justifiably have said, oh, that's interesting. Is it going to teach us about our immune systems? And the investigator would have had to say, well, no. It's completely different. And so the study section member might have said, well, then I don't care about it. I don't care about how the bacteria has its immune system. I mean, it's not going to teach me about mine. Forget it. But they didn't. They funded it. And when scientists understood the enzymes that were involved in allowing the bacterial immune system to work, they realized that they could play with that system and make it into a system that would allow human genome editing. So two studies that could have been shut down, right, easily. The study section said, there's real merit here. Let's, let's, let's look and see what's going on. So is the peer review system with its intrinsic um, uh, conflicts um, uh, the best way to work? Um, uh, and, and, and I'm going to argue that, that it absolutely is, that, that it's, it's the best grant mechanism is, is this bottoms-up, investigator-initiated proposal evaluated by fellow working uh, scientists. Think of what the alternatives are, right? There's three. There are undoubtedly others, but we know that these three ex actually exist in the world. Systems where there's central planning of research topics and projects that are then doled out to scientists. Do this, do that, here's some money, come back when you're done. Hierarchical systems, Herr Professor, who then gathers other people around who aren't as senior as um, usually he is, um, and controls the process of research for minions underneath. Or just spreading the money thinly over the country. Um, uh, giving everybody equal access to a small amount of money. By any measure, the NIH peer review system is not the best good way to allocate resources for biomedical research. I would argue it's the only good way, and the data show it. Um, it is the best. That it's shown by the publications in science that come out, the conceptual and technical advances, prizes, if you like, prizes. Um, uh, to NIH-funded researchers, uh, uh, the impact on health, don't forget that, um, and the effectiveness and efficiency with which the money is spent. So there's a little hint here. I'm going to come back to my Starbucks test in a minute, a uh, uh, test of effectiveness and efficiency of the way the money is spent. But the ongoing commitment to excellence and enhancement uh, is, is what offers the, the promise for uh, extraordinary um, uh, uh, scientific discovery and development. The problem is there's not enough money. They started that way, right? Uh, only one in seven meritorious grant applications is funded. Um, it means that there are big opportunities being lost, even though there's great stuff being done. Uh, and, and some of you know that the OMB is seeking a big budget reduction in FY18 despite the fact that right now only one in seven applications is being funded. Okay, so I'm going to come back to that, but let me just tell you one more um, uh, maybe as piece of esoterica about the way that the NIH grants are actually uh, organized. <coughs> so, so first of all, NIH grants are grants in aid. It was set up that way from 1945 in Vannevar Bush 
He said, we can work together with the research institutions and the universities and the medical schools to make this work go forward. We, the federal government can make an investment. Right? It doesn't have to pay for everything. It'll pay for part of this stuff. Grants and aid awarded to the scientific inst scientist institutions. So when I write a grant, the money doesn't come to me. It comes to UCSF. The award money is actually divided into two types, direct and indirect. Direct costs are for the, the experiments that I apply for and the equipment that I need to do the experiments. Right? Right. And part of my salary, some support for the people who are training in my laboratory. Right? And so scientists compete for that money by writing NIH grant applications. Direct costs. Indirect costs, also called F and A, F is for facilities, A is for administration, right? Provide again partial support, it's the compact with the university, for the research facilities, their operation and maintenance. Partial support for grant administration and accounting. You've got to be able to show that we're spending the money as we said that we would. Compliance with federal regulations, lots of them. Um, uh, and, and that money, the indirect costs, is the end point of uh, a negotiation with the Department of Health and Human Services or the Office of Naval Research, depending on wh where the institution gets most of its money. Every three to five years, you sit down and go through this grueling, hand-to-hand, -hand, line by line negotiation to say we at UCSF need this money to, to support the NIH funded research. They don't pay for the electric bill of UCSF. They pay for the electricity that is used in the laboratories that are doing NIH funded research. It would be sort of silly to have an electric meter and a water meter in every laboratory. And so it's done in this institutional way is a negotiation. But what's clear from that, I hope, is that both direct and indirect costs are essential parts of research. I can have the cool, a lot of cool machines, but if there's no electricity to plug into, it's a problem. So you need them both. Some of you are aware that I'm dragging you through this not, not so interesting stuff because OMB is proposing a cap on indirect costs at 10% of direct. If that were to come into play, it would be catastrophic for research. It would mean that UCSF would have an immediate shortfall of $130 million, $120 million, I guess, um, uh, in, it, that it has no way to pay for. We still would have buildings and lights and electricity. So what would happen? Research projects would stop. People would be laid off. Maybe even faculty. I might even be laid off. Right. So maybe that, that wouldn't be so terrible, but the, would it would be for some scientists. Um, uh, and and um, uh, so instead of have just, in, uh, just, just saying, we're going to make this cut. So I should say that the indirect cost rate at UCSF is 58%. So it would be almost a six-fold drop in indirect costs. Yeah. Um, uh, it should, should, should indirect costs be examined and reassessed? Absolutely. Uh, I can think of things that, that I think should be changed. Um, so a systematic look, a decision, decide to study this and look at it and make some decisions about it, totally merited. Uh, a, a draconian cut, that would be a disaster. It would, it would actually <laughs> it not just impede science, it would be catastrophic, it damage it. There are institutions with that, where the research endeavor would be shut down. I promised the Starbucks test. I'm almost done. I think this is the next last slide. So some of you may know who Mary Woolley is. She's the president of Research America. She's got a cool Starbucks test. This, this is mine. It's different from hers. So this is the Starbucks test for the effectiveness and efficiency of NIH research. You can try this on your friends. So here's the question. Over the past 40 years, it's not a question, it's a statement. Over the past 40 years, cardiovascular disease mortality has declined by 60%, and this means one million fewer deaths per year. 
So, Starbucks test. What was the NIH investment per American citizen per year, including indirect costs, I might add, in $5 Starbucks beverages that saved a million lives a year? Any ideas? How many of these it took? One. One less Starbucks a year is saving a million lives a year. Would you give up one Starbucks a year to save a million lives? Just think what could be done if we gave up two. So NIH research is pretty efficient, pretty effective, even with indirect costs. Um, uh, can we do better? Yeah. But this is not bad. Not too shabby. So NIH, described by some as a crown jewel of federal spending, clearly I've argued for qual its quality, its efficiency, its impact. And it's really thanks to the volunteer effort of working scientists who put aside their conflicts, who put aside their time, put aside their time to work on their own projects, to go review that of others. And then I peer review is just one part of this kind of volunteer effort. And to flag them for support. You can have an effect on this. Um, uh, you can go back after lunch and tell your members to join the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus, the organization that sponsors this event, monthly while Congress is in session. And you can do things that will uh, affect the NIH budget. Some of you who are associated with members on the right committees can do rather direct things, and others can talk to their members and, and others about the, what you've heard today. So you can do things that will increase funding with NIH research to the institutions and scientists and trainees that are working in your district, your state, um, and it can have an, a, a, an effect not only in the economy but on the health of people. So let me stop there. Uh, I think there's a little, no, there's not a little bit of time for questions. I'm not good at sure that. There is. Okay, there's time for <laughs> questions. If you have to leave, I totally understand, but I'm happy to take questions. Yes. I'm sorry? So the indirect costs are things like that, that go into to building research laboratories, maintaining them, keeping the water and electricity on, and then administration, so that's facilities, and then administration, so F&A, you may hear, the, hear that term when you're about indirect costs. So the A part are the administrators that oversee the, the, uh, the dollars to make sure that we're complying with what we say, how we're going to be spending them, look at lab safety. Um, uh, t haul away radioactive waste, uh, things of that sort. Um, and and uh, so those are all indirect costs, and they go to the institution because it wouldn't really make sense to be able to carve them up uh, in, uh, investigator by investigator. Um, not that I'm aware of. I haven't talked to Mr. Mulvaney about this, and, 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 um, but I'm guessing that, that um, um, Mr. Mulvaney was going through the federal agencies and saying, we've got to cut the budget. And, and he got to the NIH and saw this direct cost, indirect cost thing and said, what the hell is that? You know? Because when we've talked to um, uh, uh, Tom Price and others about this and about the nature of the decision, um, uh, really what we end up hearing at the end of the conversation is they're just, they just need to cut the budget, and this seemed like it was money that wasn't really uh, going to research itself. So they could cut the NIH budget without affecting research, and of course that's not even close to being correct. Kevin. So, um, uh, so I would argue that 
that, that uh, every grant application does undergo rigorous, re rigorous review. It's looked at by people who are experts in the field in which the application is made. Um, uh, and so I don't know what the content of the Shrimp on a Treadmill grant application was, but um, since it was funded, I would suggest that there's something there that had merit. Um, and, and maybe it wouldn't be so different in its, its title. I don't know what the title was of the... Right, and those are sort of a favorite thing to do for some members and, uh, and other non-scientists, to sort of scroll through the titles of grant applications and say, what the heck does this have to do with human health? Um, what about that, right? As, you know, uh, sequencing bacteria uh, that, that live in acidic uh, toxic waste dumps or figuring out the immune system of bacteria, right? But look what happened. Um, same story could be told for recombinant DNA and monoclonal antibodies and all the technologies that have moved the field in profound ways. Um, um, I'm not going to accuse them of being bloated bureaucracies and fiefdoms, but I agree with you that, that um, I, I think it's not justified, especially now when we're seeing the relationships, the links between these topical areas wh where um, scientists working together or evaluating grants together or funding them together could actually allow the work to move better and faster. So it's not just administrative costs. Actually, the administrative costs at, at uh, the, the NIH are not bad. Um, uh, uh, they're about 10 or 11 percent. Um, uh, but that's still over $3 billion. $3 billion is a lot of money. Um, and, and so I think an assessment of that sort would be great. It was recommended in the 2006 reauthorization of the NIH. did not happen. Uh, there are political reasons for these things being able to persist and the danger, as you said, of just having them continue to grow because they're essentially, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're going to get a budget. Um, so I think that this is something that is, in my opinion, really worth looking at. Uh, I was involved in, um, uh, this, the Coalition for Life Sciences was involved in overseeing a a report called uh, NIH Vision and Pathway that recommended exactly what you're talking about. Is it useful to know what the other 20 percent is? You said 80 percent is peer review. But if it's not useful to know that, I don't care. But it, I was just curious. No, 80 percent of the uh, over 80 percent of the money goes out in this peer review to, to grantees. As I said, about 10 percent is for administration of the NIH. That's a, still a lot of money, and 10 percent stays on campus to support researchers at the NI on the NIH campus. All right, great.